Okay, let's look at these. A, what are we doing? Oxidizing. Got an alcohol, four carbons, got a carboxylic acid, oxidizing, right? What reagent? One of the big three? How about sodium dichromate and aqueous sulfuric acid, yeah? Big three? You could also do that in two steps. You could do PCC followed by denim oxidation. But uh, big three, take it all the way to the carboxylic acid. Next one. Uh, basically, you're cleaving here. You got two carbons. Now you got two carbons. That becomes carbonyl ozonolysis. Everybody see it? There's also what's the other product that's formed here? This carbon. There's two H's there, right? That carbon becomes carbon <coughs> what? Oxygen. Yeah, from aldehyde. There it is. Ozonolysis. How do we do on those two? Test is Monday, right? Uh, we got a Grignard. This oxidative addition makes Grignard. That's essentially this carbanion. We throw it in. SN2, left or right carbon? We substitute it, right? Back over here. Yeah? Is what tertiary? Yes, that is tertiary. No, this is a strong nucleophile. A strong nucleophile, it's always what? SN2. Look at the handout. You only have a choice when it's SN1, and you only do SN1 when you have a proton, so you can protonate the oxygen, and it can have a possibility of ionizing. This thing is not going to just ionize if you don't have a proton. SN2. Uh, that's going to give that anion, and then that's going to pick up an H, and it's going to become neutral. No change in stereochemistry here. We got inversion here. The leaving group is the oxygen. It's straight up, so the nucleophile is straight down. Right? Backside attack. Uh, show the product of the Fischer projection. We have this alkene. What are we doing to the alkene? We're not cleaving, we're doing a cis-diol, right? Cis-diol. Uh, I suggest you, <coughs> you turn your starting material like this. Uh, then we can bring in the two OHs either straight up or straight down. Once you turn your starting material, your bold and dash is set. I brought in the two OHs just straight up, straight down. Then I drew it in a Fisher projection. Uh, I drew it like this, and I rotated it, it said methyls at top and bottom, methyls at top and bottom, OHs end up being on the same side, that's a rethrow. How do we do? Questions? Do what? Arethro? You didn't see arethro in organic one? Erythro means the high priority groups are on the same side of the Fischer projection. High priority groups are oxygen and oxygen. They're on the same side in the Fischer projection. That's it right there. If the OHs were on the opposite side in the Fischer projection, it would be 3O. Uh, and what kind of, oh, I almost thought that I had it wrong. It would almost be MISO. If that was an H under my hand, it would be MISO but it's not, right? You saw miso in organic one, right? Yeah. It would be what? But you can draw a Fisher projection and you can put the high priority groups. If high priority groups are on the same side of Fisher, it's a rethrow. It's like a capital E, same side. 3O has a T, things on both sides. Uh, synthesis, what functional group do we have here? Alkene, how do you make alkenes? The only way you know is elimination. We'll learn other ways later on. We'll do a lab called a Wittig reaction. Uh, eliminate, eliminate what though? 
Alkyl. Alkyl halide. What else could you eliminate? Alcohol. I took this back to the alcohol. If you had this alcohol, could you eliminate it to that? Yeah. What would you eliminate it to? Sulfuric acid. Do an E1 elimination. Okay. Now we've got to make this alcohol. How would you make it? Well, what's a good way to make alcohols? Nucleophile carbon carbon OH. I have this epoxide. I can bring in the three carbon nucleophile. And with aqueous workup, we would give that alcohol. This can come from a grain yard. The grain yard is essentially that. This will be posted upstairs. Uh, the grain yard comes from reacting this with magnesium. How do you want to make this? Ultimately, you're asked to start with the alcohol. <coughs> well, you would make that from the alcohol, react it with PBR3. That would give the alkyl bromide, make Grignard, react with epoxide, and then eliminate. Of course, if you couldn't remember how to eliminate the alcohol, you could convert the OH to a halide using something like thallium chloride, and then you could eliminate by an E2 with a strong base. You can't eliminate an alcohol with a strong base. Also, to make the oxygen leaving group, you have to have a proton. You can't protonate an alcohol with under strongly basic conditions. How do we do on that? <laughs> do what? You got to the Grignard and the epoxide? Well, Grignards are made from alpha uh, halides. And then how do you make halides? Ultimately, you got to work your way back to the alcohol that you were asked to start with. How we do, guys? Okay, I want you to see some more problems, but uh, didn't take that up for grading. Uh, we will be in lab lecture this afternoon at MR. If you're downstairs, as it says in the syllabus, if you're not taking the lab for some reason, you need to attend lab lectures. Okay. For now, we'll be in the same room as before. We have to switch rooms, but I'll let you know then at 2.30. Let's look at NMR. Questions about NMR? Questions, Stanley? I had a dream the other night that when I said there's any questions, like half the class raised their hands, like, ooh, I got a question. <laughs> Did come true. Uh, let's look at this page. Okay, here's, an, here's a proton NMR. We're doing proton, right? One to ten, basically. All the signals are labeled with letters. Uh, a. How do we get the integration? The integration's listed. I'm going to pull it down and make it bigger. Okay, we have these integral lines. Boom to boom. Uh, what is this? A lot of times when you see textbook NMR, they will blow up a signal. This is 1.2. It's actually over here. It's that signal blown up. If you're looking at this, so you can't tell if it's a single or a double. But they've blown it up for you, and you can tell it's what? Double. Carbon NMR, everything is singlets. We said that. 
here in Lev Lecture. Some of you didn't pick up on that and thought things were doublets in the carbon NMR in the lab. Carbon NMR, everything is singlets. We remove coupling, but it, okay. We have splitting and only in proton NMR. Okay. We'll talk about that a little bit more. That's a doublet. They also show this expanded at 4.9. That's the signal right here. So you can see how many lines it is. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We call it a multiplet. It's more than four. Or you can call it a septet. Okay? Uh, here are signals. This one's most downfield. Do I agree with that terminology? What letter is that? I don't think it's been assigned on there, has it? What, which, which letter should we assign to this peak? E. E. Very good. Bond to that oxygen. Greedy oxygen there. Um, okay. What is, what is the splitting of that signal or multiplicity? We just said it, right? Multiplicity. But also it's seven lines, so we can call it more precisely a septet. Why is it a septet? Let me jump ahead. What we're going to learn on the next page or two is why. The reason it's a septet, seven lines, is because it has six H neighbors. And we'll have to define neighbor. Neighbor is going to be on the adjacent carbon, not not down the street, but on the adjacent. Okay? It's going to be brief here. You see the six neighbors? It's got these two methyls adjacent to the, to the CH. Six protons. What we're going to see is a rule that's called the N plus 1 rule. It's on the next page. You don't have to write it down here. Where N is the number of neighbors. Six, right? What's six plus one? Seven. Good. That's how many lines you're going to get in your signal. That's why we've got seven lines there. Okay? We'll explain why later. So that's E. Uh, what signal might this be here? What would be most, next most downfield? I think it's actually going to be D. Let's look at integration. Here's the integration. How many H's is that? Let's call that one foot. Or well, whatever. We can measure it. How many H's is that? One. Because isn't that E? How many E H's are there? One. That's one H. <coughs> right? That signal is for the E H. There's only one H, one of those. So now we know how, what that right there is one H. So how many is this here? Well, we we gotta gotta get out a ruler, and also integration is not perfect. I kind of made that, <coughs> let's call it here to here. If that's one, how many is this? It looks like two, because isn't that two of these lengths? If that's one, that looks like two, right? That's how we use our integration for these lines. It's two h. There it is, d. There's two h's there. What's, how many H's is this? Well, if that's 2, how many is this? That's the same integral. So that's also 2H. How many, let's skip the big one. How many is this one over here? If, if that's 2, how many is this? That's like, that's like that and a half. Or if I do this, it's like, it's kind of like, but this is 3. Again, integrals, if we had a rule where we could get a little bit more precise other than this. So how many is this here? Now if you look at the structure, you can already kind of tell. What have we not done yet? B, and how many are there? Six. This is six H. It should be double this length. So if that's three, what do we got here? You see how it's double the three? So that's how you use your integral lines. Now that you have integration, we can we can help assign. So what is this signal here that's for 6H? I mean, that's B. What is this one that's 3H? Well, there's only one up there that's for 3H, and that's A. 
right? 2H, 2H, which is which? If I'm saying that was D, what's the other one? What is it? C? Does that make sense? Is it more, does it make sense that D is more downfield than C? Yes. Because D is closer to the carbonyl. So there we go. We assign all our letters. What's the multiplicity? That's a multiplet. It's actually a septet. Don't think D means doublet. What is this signal here? I think it's a triplet. So I would do a T for triplet. What is this? Multiplet. What is this one? They expanded it so you could see it. Doublet. What is this one? Triplet. There's your multiplicity that you can fill in down there. And the integration is down there. That's information you want to get from inspecting your NMR. We, I sort of briefly explained why this is a septet. Let's go backwards. The fact that this is a triplet, what does that mean? First of all, this is for what? This is A. <coughs> Isn't that for a CH3? I mean, it's A. The fact that it's a triplet, what does it tell you about this CH3? N plus 1. N plus 1 equals 3. Equals triplet, right? It's a triplet. So N plus 1 must equal 3. So how many neighbors does it have? Two. Does that CH3 have two neighbors? There it is. That's well, why it's a triple. Okay? Let's go backwards. A here. Well, let's not do A because A is got some symmetry here. Let's do D. What is he, a triplet? What's the same as that? What does a triplet mean? How many neighbors does D have? Two. It's a triplet because it has two neighbors. And two is N. And what is it? what is two plus one? Triplet. You would expect a triplet. Um, let's look at structure. The B signal. Would you don't look at what you got? Would you expect the B signal to be singlet, doublet, triplet, quartet? Why doublet? First of all, from there, when you're doing this, whatever you say for this is the same as that. So just ignore that. How many neighbors does that CH3 have on the adjacent carbon? One. One. So that's N. And one plus one is? Two. So what do you expect for B? Double. Did we get a double? Yes. Get a double. OK. Next topic, we're going to look at splitting. Oh, wait a minute. That's what we just did. Well, let's look at it more in terms of what I got written out here, okay? Why? Why does the N plus 1 rule work? Instead of trying to tell it to you, let's go through it and hopefully it will come out. Okay, consider this signal right here. It will be a doublet. Why? Well, we just explained why. How many neighbors are on the adjacent carbon? By the way, it doesn't have to be carbon. It can be adjacent atom. What does it really need to be? It needs to be neighbors within three sigma bonds. Okay? Draw these H's out. There they are. They're all the same. Whatever they're all the same, just ignore two of them and consider that one. How many H's? Now, also they have to be different H's. Identical H's don't split. How many different H's are within three sigma bonds from this one? That one. One sigma bond, two, three. Is that H within three sigma bonds? Yes. Any other different H's within three sigma bonds? No. N is one. And what is one plus one? It's going to be a double. Okay? But why? Here's a little bit of the theory. If you have this molecule in a tube, there's going to be a gazillion of molecules in there, not just one. 
Now, this is what we're, we're, we're looking at, this signal. Okay? Meanwhile, the adjacent H is either going to be aligned with the magnet or opposed to it. Now, when it's aligned to the magnet, it actually adds to the magnet strength. And so when it's aligned with the magnet, this signal is feeling more magnet. And if you feel a different magnet, your peak is going to shift. Now you also have molecules where the H is opposed to the magnet. And it's, it's basically counteracting this. This is like a shielding effect. Electrons can shield, but also neighboring protons can shield. And you actually get, you actually get a peak for this scenario, because this methyl experiences a certain magnetic field net, but this methyl experiences another one. They're actually going to be very close. You end up getting a signal for one, and then you end up getting a signal for the other. Very close. Now, ultimately, we call this one signal, but we just call it a doublet. It's actually two signals, because it's one signal for this scenario and one signal for that. Making sense? So let's get a little bit more advanced. Let's go to this signal. How many neighbors within three sigma bonds? How many H's within three sigma bonds? Two. two. So if we use the simple rule, n plus one, what is two plus one? We expect that signal to be a triplet. But why? Is it shown out here? Um, I don't think I show, I show the two molecules here. Basically, you have three scenarios. That's why you get a triplet. In some of the molecules, both of the adjacent H's will be lined with the external magnet. In some of the molecules, both will be opposed. In some of the molecules, one will be up and one will be down. And in some of the molecules, one will be down and one will be up. Well, these are actually the same, as long as the H's are the same. So how many different scenarios can you get here from the neighbors being up and down? Three scenarios. Especially you get three signals. Three signals. But we actually call it ultimately one signal, but we call it a what? Triplet. Now, when you have a triplet, the middle line is taller than the others. Why? Because it's twice as likely to have that scenario, because it's two ways to get that scenario. So your standard triplet looks like that. Now, let's go to something even bigger. What if we're looking at this signal? How many H's within three sigma bonds? What is 3 plus 1? What do you expect of that signal? Quartet. Why do you get a quartet? And what will be the shape of the quartet? Well, when you're looking at this signal, these three H's over here, they can all be aligned with the magnet. They can all be opposed. You can have two aligned, one opposed, two aligned, one opposed, or two aligned, one opposed. It's actually all the same. You could have two opposed one line, two opposed one line, two opposed one line. That's actually all the same. How many different scenarios? Four. four different scenarios. And so you get four different kind of shielding effects. But this scenario is three times as likely because you have three ways to get that scenario. So your ratio is going to be one, three, three, one in terms of your peaks. You're going to, a quartet will look like that because you have three times the likelihood of getting this scenario with that amount of shielding or deshielding. Now, every time you do this, do you have to draw out all this and think about it? No. It's actually a nice mathematical formula that goes down to what? N plus one. The n plus 1 rule tells you how many scenarios you get if you sat down and did them all. Question? So, 
Earlier you had said that identical ages don't split. So how many different ages? We have to look at how many different ages there are. So those are three different ages on that method? No. No, these three ages are identical. Yeah. But N is still three? N is the number of ages. There's three ages there, right? This is the sigma. How many, how many ages within three sigma bonds? Three. All three are within three sigma bonds. So when, when do we have to look at different ages? On the next, on the next page. We will call that complex splitting. Okay. Right now we haven't seen when we have different ages. Actually in the previous page there was one. An example of different ages on the previous page would be signal C. Let me ask you this. How many H's within three sigma bonds from, from that signal? Five. But are all five the same? No. Because the CH3 on the left side is not the same as the CH2 on the right. If they're not all the same, you cannot just say five and five plus one is six. We'll talk about what you have to do. You actually, it's quite simple. You just have to do the M plus one rule twice. Let's go ahead and do it. Forget about that over there. There's three neighbors. So n plus one is what? Four. Four. This splits it into a quartet. Don't even write it down until the next page. So you get a quartet based on this. But now that guy splits the signal. And how does it split? There's two of them. Triplet. So what it does is it turns each one of these into a triplet. So that becomes a triplet, that becomes a triplet, that becomes a triplet, that becomes a triplet. And you ultimately get how many lines? Actually you get 12 lines. You just have to do it twice. That's shown on the next page. That's called complex splitting. Uh, okay. <coughs> M plus one rule is summarized at the bottom. By the way, it's really the it's really the two I M plus one rule. But what is I for proton? One half. And if I is one half, what is two times one half? That disappears. Okay? For proton, it's n plus 1. For other nuclei, it may not be n plus 1. It says two or three sigma bonds away. It may be possible in <coughs> high systems to be further away. We'll talk about that when it's applicable. For now, within three sigma bonds. Coupling constants. Complex splitting must be on the next page after this. Question. Coupling constants. Not all double doublets are the same. You may have a doublet that looks like that, and you may have a doublet that looks like this. The distance between your lines can tell you information. And that's called the coupling constant or called the J value. <coughs> that's what I say right here. We would say this has a larger coupling constant or a larger J value, basically a wider double. And usually, in my opinion, you talk about coupling constants with doublets. But it really can be with any type of peak, triplets. Doublets are the most important. Um, here are some example of coupling constants. Coupling constants are in hertz, not ppm. Coupling constants between H's that are written in three single bonds, the ones we've been talking about thus far, is typically about seven hertz. That's really meaningless. Okay? But there's a number. If the H's are more than three sigma bonds away, 
Here it's one, two, th these are four sigma bonds away. What's the coupling constant? Zero. What does that mean? That means there's the distance between here is zero. What that means is it's just there's no coupling. That's what that means. They're too far away. There's no coupling. This means there's coupling and that's the extent of it. This would be geminal. These types of H's may or may not be the same. For example, if there was a chlorine here, they would not be the same. One would be cis to the chlorine, one would be trans. Because they're different, even though they're on the same carbon, they would split each other. They are within three sigma bonds. They're actually within two. And the splitting would actually be quite small. It'd be two. Two hertz. That would be a doublet that would be so close together, <coughs> and it would be two hertz separating. Be very tight doublet. Uh, this is probably the most, most important, the most relevant for how we use this. When you have cis or trans alkenes, assuming the H's are different, if they're trans, you're going to get a larger coupling, a wider doublet. If they're cis, the doublet will not be as wide. It'll be two-thirds as wide. And we don't really know what the Hertz means yet, although we should talk about that. If you've got a pi bond in between, sometimes you can get some long-range coupling. It would be very small. It might have not even look like a doublet. For example, here are two compounds down here. If you knew you had one of these cis or trans but did not know which one you had, one way to determine is go run a proton NMR and look at the coupling. Trans is going to be a wider coupling. The double will be wider. Cis is going to be a tighter coupling. 14 hertz, 9 hertz. That's a way you could distinguish them. In both cases, you get doublet, doublet, right? If you look at it, two doublets. Two doublets. But the width of the doublets can tell you more information. Uh, homework assignment. Determine the J value in Hertz, as always, for the most upfilled doublet. If you look at the NMR on the next page, it's about 7.02 ppm. And the HNMR of this compound. <coughs> Note that this NMR was obtained at 300 megahertz. Uh, we don't use the Bruce book anymore, so ignore the Bruce comment. So take a look at how to, how to deal with the coupling constant there. Number five. Are we all ready to do the D2 O shake? We dance back in the 1950s. D2 O shake. D2O is commonly used to identify signals that belong to exchangeable protons. Exchangeable protons are going to be your OHs and NHs, sometimes CHs. You can identify the OHs and NHs by doing a D2O shape. You add D2O, You can exchange the OH to an OD, isotopic hydrogen. And this does not give a signal in the HNMR. How does this happen? Well, it's just hydrogen bonding uh, or, or equilibrium. I mean, you got D. These, this can take a D, and you can get to this scenario. And then the OD minus, instead of taking back the D, Go back this way, it could take the H and you get this. And that's how you could show a mechanism for exchanging out the H for a D. <coughs> if you add D2O to your sample, the 
signal for this will disappear because the H is now gone. Uh, let's turn over a couple where it says D2O shake. It says D2O shake at the top. And let me show an example of this. Here's a compound that was made in the research lab. Uh, one of the research students here. Both of these signals that are indicated with the arrows, that's two H's. You got a CH2 and you got an NH2. The CH2 is going to be a singlet. Why is it going to be a singlet? What does that mean for n plus 1? If n plus 1 is singlet, that means n plus 1 is... That means n plus 1 is 1. That means n is what? So how many neighbors does it have within three sigma bonds? Zero. Do you agree that that CH2 has zero H's within three sigma bonds? Right. Look at it. I would call that an isolated CH2. Isolated CH2s or isolated H's will be singlets. So they have nothing to split them. That's why it's a singlet. But the NH2 will also be a singlet. And here's the HNMR. You've got two singlets. Which is which? Which is the CH2 and which is the NH2? I might could give a guess, but it, it can be difficult. They're both sort of in the middle. How could you determine? Do a D2O shake. Let's, let's add in some D2O, shake it up, let it equilibrate. Which of the H's will be exchanged? The CH2's or the NH2's? The NH2's will. It's, it's got a long pair, it can do the mechanism we showed. The CH2's are not coming off. The NH2 can be exchanged. Then we can rerun the NMR and see what happens. And if we flip over, we'll see the NMR after it's been rerun. And what do you see that's different? Did something happen to this signal? This signal diminished. A lot of times the textbooks will say that the peak will disappear. It may not disappear. It depends on how much D2O you add. That signal diminished. Nothing happened to that one. So what is that right there? That's the NH2 signal. It's more downfield. We identified it by doing a D2O shake and seeing it diminish because 75% of the H's were exchanged to deuterium and the peak diminished. Does that make sense how we identified the density in H2 using the D2O shake? <coughs> Mark, you had a question? Yeah. Uh, wouldn't uh, H2 be downfield from, like, from the start because it's uh, near the uh, electron of the wrong groups? <coughs> oh, so on nitrogen? That's reasonable. But again, it, it could be OHs and H's can vary. So before we did the D2O, we could only say, I think it should be. After we did the D2O, are you not more convinced that that's it? It gives us more proof. Now we're, now we're nearly certain that that's the NH2 and the one that's more upfield with the CH2. Now these are real NMRs. They don't use integral lines. Let me, let me look at, check you that. Modern NMRs, you just give you the integration at the bottom, some arbitrary number. But see how these are both about 10? That doesn't mean it's for 10 protons. How many H's is this? We know from structure. It's 2 H, right? That means with this arbitrary number, each H is what? Each H is about 5. Arbitrary number, it's really just a ratio. Since we know that's two, we know that each H is about five. Before we move on, how many H's is this for? 
2. How many H's is this for? What does that say? 17? It's kind of like 3 and a half. Uh, no, 3 and then 2 and a half. 3 would be 15, 4 would be 20. See, this is either 3 or 4. Sometimes integration is not exactly right. What is this over here? 10? Can't see, what is that? 10, so that's 2H. And what is that? 9? So how many is that? That's also 2H. Uh, this is water. This is DMSO, that, that's, or, that's your solvent, water's always present. How many H's is this? If one is five, how many is this? Yeah, that's six H's. That's a doublet six H. Uh, actually, it's not a doublet. <coughs> I wouldn't expect you to know this, but knowing structure, it's actually two singlets. That's the two methyls. There's six H's there. They're not the same. It's actually two singlets. Uh, I would not expect you to know that. It's hard to tell between a double and two singlets unless you know more information. Uh, that's just two singlets that are very close together. But in the end, you see how the integration is two and two? If we flip over, we now see, again, this is now 11. That's not 11. It should be the same thing if it was 2. It's much diminished. It's only integrating for 20% of the other. Okay. We'll have to look at complex splitting next time. Let's see what else is in this packet. We've got some problems to work. Please be looking at these and ask questions this afternoon or Friday afternoon or Friday morning. Here's a compound, formula is given. Later on we will not get formula. Based on the NMR, based on the formula, forget about Bruce. Come up with a structure. There's others in here to work. And then we will also work some in the, uh, the workbook. There's like four or five companies of spec problems in the workbook. Um, those in lab this afternoon, please bring your questions. Okay. Uh, I'll post this key upstairs. Uh, see some of you this afternoon.